Thank you very much. So I will uh, in introduce our panel and then I will step aside, but our moderator today is U.S. District Judge Rudy Ruiz. Judge Ruiz formerly served as a county and circuit judge in Miami before his appointment by President Donald Trump to the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida in 2019. Well, a hand for Judge Ruiz. Our first panelist is 11th Circuit Judge Elizabeth Branch. Judge Branch graduated from Davidson College and Emory University School of Law and was a law clerk to the Honorable J. Owen Forrester of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. Judge Branch held several key legal positions in the administration of President George W. Bush and had a successful law practice in the private sector. Uh, in September of 2012, Judge Branch was appointed to the Court of Appeals of Georgia and in 2018, she was appointed by President Trump to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge, thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Our next panelist is 11th Circuit Judge Britt Grant. Judge Grant attended Wake Forest University and earned her law degree from Stanford Law School. Judge Grant served as a law clerk to then Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She practiced with the Kirkland and Ellis firm, served in the uh, Georgia Attorney General's office, served as Solicitor General of Georgia, and she served as a justice on the Supreme Court of Georgia. Judge Grant was appointed to the 11th Circuit by President Trump in 2018. Thank you for being here, Judge. Our next panelist is 11th Circuit Judge Barbara Lagoa. Judge Lagoa attended Florida International University and earned her, earned her law degree from Columbia University School of Law. Judge Lagoa has an extensive criminal and civil legal practice. She practiced at the Greenberg Traurig firm and later joined the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Florida. In 2006, Judge Lagoa was appointed by Governor Jeb Bush to the Third District Court of Appeal. And in January 2019, Governor Ron DeSantis appointed Judge Lagoa to the Florida Supreme Court. Judge Lagoa was the first Hispanic woman and first Lat uh, Latina woman to serve on both courts. Uh, I'm sorry, but Hispanic and Cuban American woman to serve on both courts. And that is, a, that is a, uh, an amazing distinction. She is also, uh, um, or she was later appointed by President Donald Trump in 2019 to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Lagoa, as always, thank you for being here. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, is Judge Robert Luck. Judge Luck received his undergraduate and law degrees from my beloved alma mater, the University of Florida. The University of Florida was founded in 1853. Starting as a humble land-grant university, UF has rocketed its way up the US News and World Report rankings, recently landing at the number seven, as the number seven best public university in the country. Now, now back to Judge Luck. Way more impressive. Well, not, not yet. <laughs> Boasting three national football titles, numerous <laughs> SEC football championships, three Heisman Trophy winners, two back-to-back -back national basketball championships, five Final Four appearances, and numerous other SEC and national titles and other Division I sports, the University of Florida is a beacon of liberty, hope, and excellence to the world. And I dare say, if James Madison were here with us today, he'd tell you, nay, he would sing, it's great to be a Florida Gator. Judge Luck served as a law clerk to the Honorable Ed Carnes of the 11th Circuit. And Judge Luck, like Judge Lagoa, worked at the Greenberg Traurig Firm and in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Florida. Judge Luck was appointed to the 11th Circuit Court by Governor Rick Scott in 2013, and he was appointed to the 3rd DCA by Governor Scott in 2017. In January of 2019, Governor Ron DeSantis appointed Judge Luck to the Florida Supreme Court, and later in 2019, Justice Luck was appointed by, the, by President Donald Trump to the 11th Circuit. And just as a quick aside early, yesterday I ran into Judge Luck and I greeted him. I said, Judge Luck, it is so great to see you, sir. And in his humble fashion, he said, Tim, you don't need to call me Judge Luck. I've known you for a long time. You can still call me Justice Luck. So <laughs> with that, it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to Judge Ruiz. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for that warm introduction. Um, 
You know, the last time I think Tim and I shared a podium, we were celebrating the investiture of uh, Justice Munoz and then Justice Luck. And today is uh, equally special uh, for me, and I know for everyone here, that we have our four newest members of the United States Court for the 11th uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. And this is really a treat for us to uh, speak with them today and get a little bit of their insight uh, regarding not only their transition uh, to uh, the court, uh, but also just a little bit of uh, inside baseball, if you will, to get a sense of uh, their approach to the law and uh, what it's been like for them uh, in this new, very important role. So I'd, I'd like to begin a little bit uh, by speaking uh, about each of their experiences coming on to 11th Circuit. And as many of you heard, uh, all four of our panelists uh, have a state court experience, either in the uh, intermediate appellate courts or uh, in the uh, Supreme Courts of their states, whether Florida or Georgia. And obviously, I know there are many valuable lessons they learned that they've taken with us now to their new positions on the 11th Circuit. And so my first question to all of you is, what have you taken from your experience uh, on your intermediate or state Supreme Courts, and how has that helped you transition now to the 11th Circuit? French. I guess I'll start. Um, so I was on the Court of Appeals of Georgia, and just because this is mostly a Florida <clears throat> audience, what makes the Court of Appeals of Georgia different is it is statewide jurisdiction, and uh, we have criminal and civil. There are some exceptions for the cases that will skip us and go directly to the Georgia Supreme Court, but we really do have a wide, um, a, a large, significant portion of the jurisdiction of the, all the cases that are coming up through the court system. Um, and, but I think that one thing that, that definitely prepared me to go from the State Court of Appeals to the 11th Circuit is uh, getting very comfortable with sitting on a panel of three. Um, and I think Britt's experience is, is somewhat different sitting on the State Supreme Court, but there's a, there's a dynamic that happens with three that doesn't happen with one, that doesn't happen with nine. And after five and a half years on my old court, you sort of learn, you learn the nuances of how three people interact together um, and how to get along when you can get along and how not to get along when you're gonna have to dissent. Um, so I think that was a, was a great training ground for moving to the federal bench. I think that's right. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as Judge Branch said, I had a different experience because on the Georgia Supreme Court, every single case and every single cert petition and every single habeas petition and every single everything, frankly, is decided by all nine of us. So I didn't have really any experience as a panel of three. Um, it was appropriate then that my first set of arguments was on banc. And so as all of the judges on our court were <clears throat> getting ready to walk in, someone said, oh, wow, you know, this might be tough to figure out how to ask questions on, a, on an on banc hearing rather than an ordinary panel. I said, I've been fighting against you know, seven and eight men for a year and a half trying to figure out how to get some questions in. I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, <clears throat> so it was a great court to be on, and I think certainly working with other people is important on any appellate court. As a trial judge, you have the ability to make a decision and go with it, but on, a, on an appellate court, you typically have to persuade people to agree with you, um, whether it's at the outset or whether it's the way you want to put something in a particular opinion. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of a, um, interpersonal dynamic that becomes very important. And I think for me too, that's something that I, that I really learned and honed while in the state Supreme Court. And actually I'll add one thing. I know just Judge Legault is about to get started, but I will add one more thing. I think sitting on a state appellate court gave me a real appreciation for the fact that state court judges should be and are in charge of making the law of their states. Um, <clears throat> I have a great deference to my former colleagues, whether on the Georgia Court of Appeals or the Georgia Supreme Court, and I think um, as a federal judge, I think it would be easy to think, well, you know, we know what we're doing too, but I think it's really important for us to have that um, understanding that the state courts have a really important and crucial role and a constitutional role to decide the law in their states and for us to hang back as much as we possibly can in those areas. Well, I was fortunate enough to be on the uh, state appellate courts for the last 14 years, uh, first on the Third District Court of Appeal and on the Florida Supreme Court. And as Judge Branch indicated, when you're on the intermediate appellate court, you sit in panels of three. And so I feel like I'm, to some degree, back home mm -hmm. at the 11th Circuit as I'm sitting now in panels of three. Now, the interesting thing is 
that when you sit in panels of three, there is a different dynamic because the panels change constantly and you have to understand the nuances of the panel members that you're sitting with and how they approach a case. And so one of the new things will be getting to know the new members of the court that I've joined and learning how they approach cases. Because everyone has a different, you may reach the same result, but you may have a different approach on how you get there. And you have to be respectful to everyone's process. And the most important thing about being on a uh, intermediate appellate court or a court where you're sitting in panels of three is collegiality and knowing how to disagree without being disagreeable. And uh, that's something that I've learned, and I learned it on the uh, being a member of the Third District Court of Appeal. Now, interesting, obviously, on the Florida Supreme Court, we sat together on banc all the time. And so, again, I'm not also, I also know how to speak <laughs> since I was the only woman on the court, right, Justice Lawson? I didn't ever have any problem speaking. Um, but to me, that's really the, the difference. And um, the, the interesting thing is on the Third District Court of Appeal, we were always in one building. So all the judges, so we had court conferences and oral arguments in one building. And at the Florida Supreme Court, even though the justices could live in different parts of the state, all our business, whether it was court conference or oral arguments, were always in Tallahassee. So the, I'm kind of looking to the, what I think is going to be an interesting part of this job, which is having uh, oral arguments in different parts of whether it's in Jacksonville or Miami or Atlanta, Montgomery. So that's going to be a little interesting not to be in one place at all the time. Um, I, <clears throat> if I can, I, let me just echo the, the two things that I very distinguished and more experienced panel members uh, have said. The first is about being on a collegial body. I think being on a, an appellate court before helps you to know how to be on a collegial body. Um, and I feel blessed that I've had the opportunity to do that. Um, and on the deference issue, especially with regard to post-conviction and habeas stuff, that stuff is written in the statute that we are to defer to the reasonable application of law by uh, by these state courts, and I agree, having served in those state courts, seeing what they do is absolutely vital to understanding that, that level of deference and how the good folks in our state courts are doing the heavy lifting of our constitutional uh, order every single day, and that that deserves uh, both statutory and constitutional deference. The only thing I would add uh, to what anyone has said is the volume. The 11th Circuit per judge has more cases than any other circuit in the entire country. Um, <laughs> That's a great thing, but I think having had worked in the very busy Florida court system, especially on the DCAs, but even at the Supreme Court, you know, at the DCAs, we had hundreds of cases per year um, that we had to deal with. Each judge at the Supreme Court, you know, what do we have, 2,000 filings a year, something like that, that we sit on the Mon Banc always. Um, so I, I do feel very prepared um, that to, to have the work come in. Whether I'm gonna be good at it is a separate issue, but um, uh, I definitely feel prepared with, with all the boxes and the emails and the cases that are coming in. And I, and, well, I don't wanna speak for my colleagues, I, I have a feeling they're doing so great because they had that experience too. Thank you, Judge Luck. And I know we, we I think, did a roll call uh, earlier today about how many state judges we have here this year. Um, and so I know that for those of us uh, that serve on the state bench and still do and are very active on the state bench, that hearing about that deference and that interplay is, a, is very important to all of you. And also just neat to have jurists of this caliber that have been in the trenches where many of our state jurists are on a daily basis. Now, those that were here yesterday heard uh, Don McGann speak a little bit about the process and, uh, and the long road it takes to get to where these folks are uh, here today. And uh, there was a bit of a discussion about the hyper-partisan uh, atmosphere uh, that has uh, made this process perhaps more challenging than ever before. And I know all of our panelists today successfully navigated this process, um, and it's very challenging not only on them, I'm sure they will share with you, but on their families as well. And so I was wondering if you would share with us a little bit about your respective journeys uh, to the 11th Circuit, uh, whether there was maybe some part of the process that stands out, maybe something in the initial vetting or in the uh, Senate Judiciary hearings, but some memory that you'd like to share with our audience that kind of encapsulates for you uh, how challenging, but of course yet rewarding the path is. Judge Branch? Really, all aspects of the process are challenging in different ways. And, and just to give you an idea a little bit about how the, the different, what the different phases are, 
first you get called up and you have an interview at the White House, which I always like to tell people was, was probably one of the toughest interviews, well, was the toughest interview I've ever had. Um, it's a room um, with, with multiple people and um, I always say it was one of the meanest interviews. So you would give an answer and usually as you've gone through your careers and you've gotten more senior, when you give an answer, people will smile back at you. There was none of that. It was, <laughs> it was follow up question, follow up question. I'm looking at you, Judge Katzis, um, who, who, <laughs> who was there. <laughs> he said you passed. There you go. Um, so, so that's the first thing that you're kind of thrown into that, and it bears no resemblance to anything you've ever gone through before. And then when you get the call, so it's, you go through these highs and lows, like it's you know, the difficult process and then something good happens. So you get the call that the president is, is going to nominate you, but first you get to start filling out an FBI background form. And they said, okay, it's Friday afternoon, we're gonna need it on Monday. Um, I turned it in, not Monday, but like the following Friday because of everything that was asked of me. I had to gather a lot of information from my law firm, which just <coughs> involved, um, they had to print every document I ever created in my entire existence at the law firm, and I had to look at every piece of paper to gather all of the information that was necessary. Um, so it was kind of an excruciating process in and of itself. So you get done with that and you think, okay, well, and you have a day job. You're, you're trying to do all of this while you're also doing what, whatever your day job is, which was for me on the Court of Appeals of Georgia. And so you turn that, out, that in and you think, okay, now I can relax a little bit. And they said, okay, well, we have a Senate Judiciary Questionnaire we're gonna need you to start filling out. And you go through umpteen drafts of this. And um, every time you get uh, an edit back, you're just, you, your shoulders kind of sag because it's, you're still pushing forward with that. And then you get it turned in. And you think, okay, now I really am gonna go back to my day job. And then you start this waiting game because, well, first of all, that is sent to the Senate. And then you start waiting for a Senate hearing date. And then you, they'll call you and say, maybe you'll go this Wednesday. So you get your family and friends lined up, you buy airline tickets, and they say, ooh, we've actually changed, we're moving it, and somebody else is gonna go on Wednesday, but maybe you'll go in two more weeks from now. So you just have this, mo this, this game where all of your family and friends are changing their airline tickets every single time. And then when you finally get the call that the hearing is gonna go forward, you start preparing for that, and you thought the interview at the White House um, was tough. Getting ready for a Senate hearing, it's not getting ready for a deposition, it's, it's not like anything. Um, a lot of sleepless nights getting ready for that. But I do have to say that the, every person in the White House and in the Department of Justice that, that helped me along the way was unbelievable, um, including Judge Katzis. But certainly I would be remiss if I didn't mention somebody who's here in the audience right now, uh, Rob Luther, who really walked beside a lot of us throughout the whole process, and so many other people. Don McGahn was amazing, and everybody that worked with him. Um, so then you get your Senate hearing and, and you survive that, more or less. And then you, then you start waiting again. Um, and again, you go back to your day job and you think that this is never, you, are, are you gonna get out of committee and what are the votes gonna be? And then you start waiting again. When is the vote gonna go to the full Senate? And I had come out of committee and were just kind of hovering around and Judge Billy Ray, who was my colleague on the Court of Appeals of Georgia, called me up yelling. And if you know Billy Ray, you know if Billy calls you, you aren't really sure if he's gonna tell you the truth. Um, and so he called me and he goes, they're, they're voting on you right now. I said, that's absurd. I mean, why would I not know that in advance? <laughs> and I said, you are lying. And he's holding up his phone to his computer saying, turn on your computer right now. Um, and so we watched the vote. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there and you realize, I just got confirmed by the Senate. Um, and, and then you're just, then it's just a process of navigating when is the president gonna sign the commission and, and then uh, when are you gonna get sworn in. But so that's sort of an overview of the process. And I think they, all of the phases of it were difficult but incredibly rewarding. And I just feel so blessed to have been chosen to go through that process and to have the opportunity to sit on this court now. Um, Judge Branch has done such a marvelous job of describing the, the whole process that I'll only add a few things um, that stick out in my mind on a personal basis. 
When I got the call that the president was planning on nominating me, I was actually sitting in my campaign fundraiser's office making fundraising calls, which is easily the worst part of being a state judge, in my view, um, is having to make fundraising calls. So for those of you who receive them from state lawyers, know that it is not something that they're enjoying. Um, but it's something you have to do to, in order to maintain the job and be able to continue to serve in that role. And so I went out in the hall and heard, you know, it, it was not... It was not expected as far as timing. Um, and But of course, it's important to keep that confidential because it's not my announcement to make. It's the president's announcement to make um, at the time when the White House sees fit. And so at the same time, I didn't want to be fundraising if I was going to potentially be in this new job. So I went in and told my fundraiser that I had a scheduling conflict, and I don't think I've made another fundraising call. You can't take anything for granted, but at the same time, I really wanted to respect my contributors and not, not be asking them to, to put money towards something that may not occur. Um, so that was a rather glorious part of the nomination, was not having to do that anymore. Um, a funnier part also was I really wanted to have my kids in the hearing room, not because I wanted to spend that time with them, but it's my theory that it's at least a little bit harder to be really mean to someone if their cute kids are sitting there in the, <laughs> in the hearing room. So I, I made sure to have them, you know, in their Sunday best, little jackets and bow ties for the boys, a new dress for the girl, and a lot of bribery, as I told chair, the chairman of the committee, um, to make sure that they helped my process rather than hurt it. So those are a few, a few moments that stand out for me, and it, it all worked out. I'm so thankful to the White House and DOJ for all the, the constant support and to all the support from, frankly, friends within the Federal Society. This has been a wonderful organization um, for building friendships and creating um, professional relationships, and it's just meant, meant a really lot to me. And, and before Barbara gets started, I wanted to add one personal note that I think makes this panel a little bit unique. Um, Britt and I were very close friends before we started going through this process. And to walk through this process together and have the end result be that we get to serve on this court together, both in Atlanta for the rest of our lives, has made this so incredibly special for me. And to know that, that we get to walk this walk together is, is a relatively unique thing. That's absolutely right. And it makes, it, it makes an extraordinary difference, too, on a day-to-day -day basis, to have someone who's already such a close friend down the hall to be able to just have those conversations that you want to have about work that, in this job, ordinarily you can't do that. So it's been just a true gift for me as well. Well, I think that uh, Judge Luck and I have a little bit of a different story. Uh, our situation was very fast and very rapid. <laughs> Uh, we got the calls in August, and we had we were confirmed by November. So our process was uh, very intense. I think we can we can both agree mm -hmm. on that. Um, I think that it's interesting because I agree with Judge Branch. That was the hardest interview I ever had at the White House um, because there was no response to anything, and that's a very hard when you're doing an interview and it is a poker face, and there's nothing, there's no feedback. You don't know, is this, am I doing well? I'm not doing well? And that was a very intense interview. Um, but before I got to the interview, I had received a, a phone call, and I was in Miami because I was trying to get ready for our argument and go up to uh, Tallahassee, and I guess I had gone, this was my second phone call from the White House, but they wouldn't tell my JA why they were calling. So my JA goes, I really think you really need to call them back because they won't tell me what they want. <laughs> and when I did, they, they indicated that they wanted me to come up to interview. And I'm like, okay, I, I'll go up to interview, but I'm in the middle of getting ready for our argument. And so we, we hopped on a plane and interviewed and then got back to Tallahassee for um, oral argument. And that was a little interesting because then they said the president would like to nominate you and you need to have your FBI thing done yesterday. <laughs> Which I don't know if you understand what the FBI background search is. You have to do everything that you were, anything that you did from the time that you were 18 years old, even unpaid internships. That is very intense. To, to get back all that information and where you were, 
who knew you at that time. It's a lot of paperwork. So the nominees, before you become a nominee and after you become a nominee, the amount of paperwork is intense. Um, and getting ready also for the uh, Senate questionnaire was also very intense. A lot of paperwork. Getting ready for the hearings. Uh, one of the ways that you get ready for the hearings is by watching other nominees. And I had the pleasure of watching the two of you who did an amazing job in your interviews. And I, my dining room became my war room. And uh, just watching hearing after hearing. I even made my daughters watch hearings um, so that they would be prepared uh, to be behind and not, not uh, say, don't be mean to my mom. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, it was uh, a wonderful process. And my father-in-law had the best advice when we were walking into the confirmation hearing. And I thought, why is he telling me this at the time? But he said to me, enjoy it and be yourself. And I'm thinking, why are you telling me this? But it was true. When I got into the room, I remember thinking, I'm going to enjoy this moment because this is a lifetime, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And to enjoy the experience that I was going to have, that my children were having, meeting senators and watching our Constitution in action, which was beautiful. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I enjoyed having my friend and colleague, Robert Luck, with me. And we, we definitely had the room covered with children. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it really is a, a very intense process, but it's a very rewarding process in the end. I, I don't have much to add to <clears throat> the great summaries that, that each of my colleagues have given. Um, I would just reiterate three points, or, or explicate three points. First is, and, and Justice Legault mentioned, or Judge Legault, I have to change that too. Judge Legault <laughs> mentioned this about how quickly our process was, and, and if I could, I can. I want to compare it to uh, my friend Rudy Ruiz, uh, who is uh, gracious enough to moderate today. Judge Ruiz, from the moment that he started, which was putting in his application at a judicial nominating commission that was put together by two senators, until he was confirmed, was almost two years um, in that process for a district court judgeship. As uh, Judge Lagoa just said, I got a call July 31st. I still have the little pink sheet. My, you know, those like call back numbers. The White House called. Remember yesterday when, when uh, Justice Thomas said, when a building calls, don't call back? Well, I had one of those. The building called uh, and said, call back. Um, that was July 31st. That was confirmed November 19th. Um, that it's just amazing. I, I, I don't know what to attribute that to other than uh, to prayers and a higher power than myself. Um, it, there's lots of things that happen with these things, but we just fell into a position um, where uh, Judge Legault and I both went very quickly. Um, and I owe that to a lot of people, many in this room, many who I've thanked in person and will continue to thank for the rest of my life. Um, let me thank yet again the, the, the amazing woman sitting next to me um, who I've uh, traveled to the third DCA with, uh, traveled to the Supreme Court with, traveled here with, and um, I'll be next to you no matter where you go. Right. <laughs> um, the what? Thank you. I, I should end there, but there is, I, I, and I'm glad Judge Branch did this. The, the people who work at the White House and Department of Justice doing this are. are are true patriots and amazing people. They work behind the scenes. No one gives them credit for the stuff. They don't want credit for this stuff. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, that the team that, that Judge Katzis and Rob put together are the team that uh, Judge Legault and I benefited from. That's Beth Williams at the Department of Justice and Kate Todd at the White House and Pat Cipollone um, and, and their team. And if I can mention Jordan Pratt, who was my Sherpa throughout, who's here today. Um, <laughs> They, uh, they make it possible. Um, and I am, uh, for, I've told them, but I will tell them again, I am forever grateful uh, for, for their help. I would like to raise one objection, to lodge one objection, that when Judge Grant and I went through the process, circuit judges got to go by themselves before the, in the Senate hearing. And there's something to be said for when you are alone and you are the first panel um, and doing that pro the Senate confirmation hearing by yourself. And so I would like to object that that process seems to have now changed, and they got to go through it together. I, I, had, a, I, this, sorry, I had a district court judge I will not name uh, come up to me the other day and say, congratulations, 
you know, it's so unfair how quickly you went. I spent three years <laughs> toiling in this process and so-and-so held us up and, and you have no idea how lucky you are. And I, I mean, I just couldn't help but say you're right. Um, <laughs> we're just, just so yes. absolutely blessed um, to have been through it so quickly. But yes, uh, we, Judge Lugo, if you've seen our hearing, Judge Lugo and I did it together. Um, I, 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 I would often said, as I have throughout my career, which is exactly what she said, <laughs> Uh, to, the, to the point that, that, that the chairman of the Judiciary Committee makes the comment of, you know, you're getting away with murder up there. Uh, <laughs> I'll add one actual point about the hearings. Among recently confirmed federal judges, you'll find that anyone who had their hearing before you were confirmed, you know them. You feel like you know them. You feel like you know everything about them because you've watched their hearing 15 times. And then as soon as you have your hearing, you stop. And <laughs> so there's a great dynamic of knowing those who have so come true. before and not those who have come after. With, I will say, the one exception is that I've watched the hearing of these two great judges um, after, after my hearing happened. You know, I kind of mentioned that uh, Judge Grant, I was thinking the same thing when you were saying the video. You know, you watch so much, and I remember watching Judge Branch and Judge Grant go, and, and then you meet them and you feel like you know them, right. or they, they exist because you've watched the tape over and over again. It's kind of like, preparing for the Super Bowl or something. You know, you just keep watching a lot of film because you want to know how it's going to work. And every single one of them, if you, if you haven't watched it, it's archived. If you're very bored, you can go watch all of their hearings. They all had wonderful experiences. I think knowing how difficult the process is, they navigated about as, as best as possible. I think Justice Thomas said yesterday, it is political theater is the only way to describe the nature of these hearings. And, and all of them were able to navigate it. So I know for those of us on the dis district court level, we watched uh, all of them go through it, and uh, and they did such an amazing job of uh, handling some very difficult questions. And I will say, you, you all shared how you guys get to go, they now get to go in panels. The best thing about us is they always go before the district judges. So circuit judges, unfortunately, are the opening line of defense, and they take a lot of the heat. So by the time we get up there, it's the temperature's a little bit down. So we owe them a debt of gratitude, <laughs> those of us on the district court, because by the time uh, most senators are done with the circuit nominees, they tend to go to other things, so it's a lot uh, easier road for us. And I will say that I, I feel at least Chad or Rob, some people smiled at the White House interview with me, but I think it's because district court, they were a lot more relaxed. I think it was a little tougher. It sounds like it was a tougher crowd. Um, but I think all of you understand the one common thread between all the judges is it takes a village. And, uh, and, and I can only echo what they said to everybody here that's been through the process knows that we wouldn't do it without so many faces in this room that helped us navigate it. Now I'd like to turn a little bit to your new job and uh, a little bit about your process um, and how you approach cases. And uh, I think you know, for our audience, it would be interesting for them to understand a little bit about your approach. And so I'm, I'm curious if each of you could share a little bit about your, um, your preparation. Uh, in particular, uh, we can speak on uh, first uh, in writing opinions for the court. Uh, how do you prepare? Perhaps what role do your clerks play? What is kind of your, your process as you get ready to do something like that? Judge Branch? Um, I think my process uh, has, has really remained the same um, from coming from the Court of Appeals of Georgia to now. Um, and it, it involves a, a, an incredible amount of preparation. And you as lawyers and as judges certainly know what, what that means. You're preparing the briefs, the lawyers are preparing the briefs and the record, and we are, we are we're reviewing all of those in depth. Um, I do work with my clerks on the cases, um, we necessarily have to, but we have a lot of discussions before writing starts on opinions, um, and the, the conversations and the interactions with my law clerks continue throughout the process. Um, I'm, I'm edit it's heavy, heavy editing. They may come up with the first draft based on the co initial conversations that they've had with me, um, but then the heavy editing begins. In fact, I had one law clerk, we were in the process, it's a case that's going to be published, there's a dissent, and so this had been an incredibly intense writing and rewriting and more edits and more edits, and he looked a little shell-shocked, and he, I gave him more edits, and he said, does this always happen? <laughs> and I said, yes. Um, and it's certainly uh, when you are going to publish and when there is a dissent and a majority, it's that, that sense is even heightened. Uh, and I had to explain that to him. 
that the going through the number of drafts is very, very normal. But so I stay very involved um, in the process from start to finish. They're in my office. We're talking through issues. They're debating issues amongst themselves, which I also try to encourage. I want the, the clerks to have the relationship not just with me, but with each other. And that's certainly one way of, of doing that. So it's really, uh, you know, I'm involved in the process from start to finish, um, and sometimes I'm just, I just take over writing it. It depends on the, on the case and on the opinion, um, but it's a very hands-on effort uh, for, for all of the cases. I'll say two things to follow up on that. For me, um, on published opinions, my process is, it sounds like similar to what Judge Branch does, but it's also one that I really learned when I was clerking for then Judge Kavanaugh. Um, we had a very iterative back and forth process. Um, the clerk would do the first draft and then approximately 5,000 drafts later it would get published. So I try to, I try to do the same, the same thing. And I, think, I do think that it, it helps get the opinion to the right place, um, both for, for the ultimate question and also it helps the clerk to really be there for every step of the process to see how it changes in an iterative way over time and to see why certain changes are made and to really feel like it holds, holds together better. During my first year, I was working on a, a big opinion and the clerk came in at one point, I don't know, maybe 12 drafts in, he said, Judge, it's really starting to sing, I love it. So it's great to hear clerks really being able to see and understand the changes and see kind of how their work has improved. And I'll tell you, it's, it always takes fewer drafts at the end of the year than it does at the beginning of the year, which also makes me feel good that I'm doing my job training my law clerks. Um, I know my experience clerking was so extraordinary for me that I want to make sure to give my clerks as much training um, and development for their career as I can in the same way that I was fortunate to receive it um, from Judge Kavanaugh. And on a, on a totally separate note, we have a lot of unpublished opinions. Um, and I'll add that when I was a practicing lawyer, I thought, why doesn't the 11th Circuit ever hear oral argument? Why do they have this low number of oral arguments? And why do they have all these unpublished cases? But now that I'm on the court, I think the number is that we hear oral argument in about 20% of our cases. I looked on our last report, and my cases that I've decided are right at 81.5 have been decided without oral argument, and then the rest with oral argument. So you can be assured as a lawyer that if any judge thinks that a case ought to go to oral argument, then it does. That's what our process, that's the way our process works. And I think that a lot of the more straightforward cases, it's more efficient for the court and for the lawyers to resolve those on the briefs. And so that's the way, that's the way we do it, and that's one way that we manage our incredibly high caseload. But it was pretty interesting having, having questioned the statistics before I got there and then finding that my, my own review led to a really similar number of cases being decided um, without oral argument. Well, I think my um, approach is, is very similar to uh, both Judge Branch and Judge um, Grant's approach. In terms of writing and pr preparation, for purposes of whether it's oral argument or even non-oral argument cases, I'm going to review all the briefs, the record, uh, the case law. I have discussions with my law clerks. And I do think that initially they're a little surprised by, I think when I was at the third DCA, they would see this is like draft 12 of an opinion. And they would sort of be surprised that we had so many drafts. But I, I hope that I encourage my law clerks to, to become better writers and better lawyers at the end of the clerkship. At least that's my, my goal. And one of them is to make them better writers and to understand that there's a draft, and then you edit, and then you edit again, and then you edit some more. And sometimes uh, when you're editing, you realize that you're still missing a piece of something that you need to include in the, in the discussion. And it comes through in the writing process and also the conversation that you're having back and forth with your law clerk. Because sometimes when you're writing, uh, it either happens or it doesn't. You may go to conference and you may all decide that this case is gonna be an affirmance or it's gonna be a reversal. And you may look at each other and say, I'm gonna try to write it, let's see if it writes. Because sometimes things don't write. And that's why it's a process of going back and forth with your law clerks and even with your colleagues to say, I've, I've tried to approach it this way and it's not, uh, it's not working, but I thought of this process and rewriting it in this manner and this seems to be working. 
Um, so it's a collaborative effort, not just with your law clerks, but also with your colleagues. Um, but it doesn't. It does take a great deal of time to to get an opinion out, and I think sometimes people don't understand that there are cases that are simple and you can get it done in a day or two, and there are other cases that may take uh, a couple months because there's a back and forth, a dissent, and you have to respond to the dissent, or you are the dissent, and the majority has to respond, and you either try to reach consensus or, uh, uh, you know, and so it just becomes, it's a process, and it's not an, always an easy process. I just found the bathroom, so I'm I'm not sure um, I'm not sure I know what to uh, what, how to answer so far. Um, I can tell you at the at the intermediate appellate court and the Supreme Court, uh, I generally the process was similar. Other than that, I generally wrote the first draft, and then the clerks I, the way I told my clerks is just go make it better. It, it kind of stinks right now. Make it a lot better, um, and they would make it better, and then they give it back to me, and um, I tweak it, and I think it was the back and forth. Uh, but I think I had more time to be able to do the, the first draft. Um, or some outline of it, or more of the first drafts myself. I, I know I'm gonna have less time to do that where I am now. Um, the judge I clerk for, Judge Carnes, the way that we would do it is we'd, we'd work on some sort of first draft, although not always. There's some segment of cases he would handle himself, but you know, we'd put together some sort of first draft. And, and once it was in a shape where it, you know, we could work with it, he would sit down at his computer and we literally would be next to him. And it's the most excruciating process I could possibly imagine. When you're sitting there and just everything's being torn apart, every assumption's being torn apart, you're looking through every case, you're looking through every fact, and, and just writing together. And I can tell you that I learn more from that um, than, than just about anything I learned in law school. Um, and I don't know that I'm gonna do exactly like that with my clerks, but it'd be great if I got to do that. Um, and I think that I, I echo uh, Judge Grant's statement that uh, you hope that the clerks, they get a lot out of it, but one thing is that they are better coming out of the process and that you're better coming out of the process. And I think that's, that's really all you can hope for. So Judge Grant just mentioned a little bit about oral argument, about 20% or so statistically. We just spoke a little more on the side of the writing process for the oral argument preparation. Is there anything in particular you do differently, uh, anything uh, novel or new in your approach that you would do or wouldn't do in another case when you have a setting and you know it's coming up? Judge Branch. Um, the law clerks are certainly heavily involved in, uh, in the oral argument process. They're, I have the law clerks prepare a bench memo for each case. And in looking through, when I'm getting ready, what my preparation is, going through the, the briefs and the record, um, and then when I'm turning to the bench memo, if I have questions, um, I will go back to them. And there may be some additional research uh, that needs to be done. Um, fill in any holes that have come up that we that I see uh, in the bench memo, and they all the my law clerks this year I've noticed have started having a lunch where they debate all of the oral argument cases after they've finished up the bench memo, and I've I've come in and they're having disagreements about. Uh, certain issues, and so that is also helpful, and that's just on their own initiative. Um, that's been helpful to see where those disagreements are. They, they might be points that I need to know about um, and be more prepared for before oral argument. Um, but, you know, there's an intense preparation that comes with oral argument, um, that, that it's, it's a much heavier preparation than it is with the non-oral uh, argument cases. And then you can ratchet that up a notch when you talk about the cases that we're taking en banc. Um, each of these different areas is sort of its own animal, um, and the process differs a, a little bit. When I first got on the 11th Circuit, we had an en banc case pretty quickly after I got there that had been put in motion before I got there. And I asked how many of these, how many cases are we taking en banc? Is this a pretty frequent thing? Is this rare? And they said, oh, it, it's very unusual. Um, not anymore. Um, since we've been, since Britt and I have been here, we have taken an extraordinary number of en banc cases, and I'd, I would imagine that that trend continues. We shall see. I agree with that. I agree with that contention. Um, I'll add as far as oral argument preparation, it is it is a much um, a much deeper process because you've got you've got the time and you really need to make sure 
that you know everything that you need to know about the case before those advocates get up there, um, both in order to have the information you, you need to decide at a conference and out of respect for the people who you know have been working really hard to get ready for that day in court to represent their client. I think it's really important for the judges to, to make sure that we've done our preparation so that everyone, everyone is ready for that. And I think I've seen that same, that same ideal from all of my colleagues on the 11th Circuit. Um, the clerks really do love the oral argument cases. Um, they work on oral argument cases and non-oral argument cases. They sometimes forget that judges have, you know, about 20 hours a week on, on other things. Um, it seems like all we're doing is the cases with opinions. But the clerks love the oral argument cases. In my chambers, I let them choose which ones they'll work on. So they do what we call the NFL draft process. They, they each have a number um, for that round. First, number one picks the case first, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, et cetera, and on and on. And I can always tell, I don't let them, I don't let them divide the cases until a certain time before oral argument, because otherwise, that would be all that they would do. Um, and I said, you need to remember, the product of this office is not bench memos. I need you to work on other things. Um, so it's always fun to hear them laughing and talking about the cases and debating which ones they're gonna pick. So that's a, a fun little aspect of um, life in chambers. Well, it's funny because I think we, we have that process. I don't know if my law clerks talk to your law clerks, but, <laughs> but they, we do have a round pick like that now. Um, but I did ask my clerks who, who work with me um, if they have any interest in particular, if they're interested in criminal law, if they're interested in habeas, so that I could try to give them those cases when they come in the door um, if they have a particular interest. Um, for purposes of oral argument, I agree. I think that a judge whether you're on the 11th Circuit or you're even a trial court judge, your job is to be prepared when the lawyers come in. And it's your opportunity and your chance to speak to the attorneys. And so in order to be able to have a, a conversation with the attorneys, you need to know the record and understand what the issues are. And that does involve a great deal of work and preparation. And um, you know, I've been doing that for the last 14 years and I take it very seriously because it is, your responsibility as a judge to be very prepared when the lawyers walk in, because they're gonna be prepared, and it's a disservice to, to them not to be prepared and to their clients. So our obligation is to be prepared, and the clerks understand that, and, um, but they do think that bench memos are all that there is sometimes, but no, there's other work to be done as well. Um, so luckily, I have not done oral argument yet. We're having oral argument coming up soon, and I'm looking forward to my first oral argument sitting as a member of the 11th Circuit. I mean, yeah, I, I just got on the court, so uh, these things are gonna change as, as I get better and learn the systems better. Um, I can tell you how I did it in my past jobs, and I can tell you how uh, my, my, the judge I worked for did it and that, that I'd like to try to emulate. Um, I, the way I describe it is it's a double blind process. I have the clerks working on a bench memo similar to the ones described by my colleagues, but then I'm preparing myself. So I've read all the briefs, I've read every case cited, I've read all the relevant portions of the record, and then I've reached a tentative conclusion of my thoughts on the case, and only then do I read the bench memo, because I don't want to be tainted by what they did. And when I read it, sometimes the clerks have thoughts or have seen cases or have done something that I haven't quite thought of, and sometimes I just flat disagree with them. They just didn't see it and got it wrong. Um, but that helps me to, to, to understand the case better and it's a check on my process to make sure that I'm getting everything, that I'm seeing everything, that I didn't miss anything. Um, so that, that's how I, I see the, the, the work with the clerks um, in terms of oral argument. Um, and, and I agree with what everyone said is, you have to be ready to go because your colleagues are gonna be ready to go in a collegial body. And it couldn't be less collegial if you got there and you were behind what they did. You didn't know, you hadn't read the cases, you hadn't looked at the record, you weren't prepared to make a decision on that day. That's a disservice to the attorneys and to your colleagues. Um, so I, I think for all of us, oral argument really is the, when you set a case for oral argument, it's, it's there, it's important, and it gives us the opportunity of we have to prepare. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention one thing that Judge Grant said. Um, I, I'm much more dictatorial. I tell them what bench memos they're gonna have. Um, the reason is um, I, I, I want them to be spread even. So I spread even the criminal cases, I spread even the civil cases, and you find over time that some clerks are just better than others, um, and that way you can sort of calibrate things when you have there, and you learn that over time uh, with clerks. Um, 
But I agree with Judge Grant completely. Uh, Judge Carnes gave us a two week window before our argument for bench memos. You couldn't look at them before the two weeks and you had to be done in that two weeks. And those were a hell of a two weeks trying to <laughs> get all those done in that time. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be quite, the window's gonna be quite as tight and I hear he doesn't do it quite as tightly anymore. Um, but which is, which is much more sane. Um, <laughs> don't tell him I said that. Uh, but um, I, there needs to be a window there because what happens is it, it sort of ebbs and flows. You have oral argument, then you got to get the opinions done, and then you have another oral argument, and you got to get those opinions done. And, and in the, between them is all the non-oral argument stuff, the, the 80 percent of the unpublished stuff that, that Judge Grant was talking about. So um, you have to work with those flows, and if you minimize that time, then you could be working on the other things. So that's, that's sort of how the ebbs and flows of a chambers work. So Judge Lagoa, you just mentioned a little bit about lawyers and coming in, into your courtroom prepared. And we have a lot of folks here who do practice, uh, in some cases, regularly before your court. Um, and so I know that you've been on uh, the 11th Circuit at different, varying degrees of time, but obviously all of you have a lot of experience coming into your current positions. Are there any patterns or practices um, by lawyers that you are seeing now in your current position um, that you think are successful, you think are wise, a good approach? And conversely, anything that you've already seen that troubles you or you could help practitioners here understand things that you're looking for and, uh, and that you want them to do or not to do? Judge Branch. I think my answer um, is the same as it w on the 11th Circuit as it was when I was on the Court of Appeals of Georgia. Um, first and foremost, just as we've talked about the intense preparation that goes in uh, for all the judges before we walk into oral argument, um, I hope that goes without saying that the same needs to be happening on the part of the lawyers. And, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the time um, that has happened. There have been times and it was more in my old job that I ran into this a couple of times where um, you can see a lack of preparation. Um, nerves, that's one thing. Um, and, and I've seen people get upset during an oral argument when it's starting to, to go awry in a way that they have not seen it coming. That's a whole different thing too. But lack of preparation um, is I think um, the deadliest thing walking into an oral argument. Um, certainly in, your briefs and in your presentation as lawyers to the court, accuracy above all else. Um, you need to have the proper case citations. It needs to actually say what you say it says. If you're citing to the record, make sure that that actually, you haven't just gone a little bit astray and been too strong on what you think your this deposition transcript shows. The funny thing, you pretty quickly as a judge develop a sixth sense. You read something and you're like, there's no way that it's this strong, the, the case that they're citing stands for the proposition as strongly as they say it does. Or there's no way that somebody said that in a deposition. And you, you'll pull it, I pull it. I'll pull the case, I'll pull the deposition transcript. And you have spent your whole life as lawyers trying to establish your good reputation. It can be lost so quickly because I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember the person that caused me to pull it and find out that it's not exactly as you said it is. And judges talk amongst ourselves. Um, so I think those are, those are certainly the words of advice. As I said, most people, 99%, 99.9% of the time, everybody, all the lawyers appearing before me are doing all of those things extraordinarily well. Um, probably, it, it, especially the preparation that I see coming into oral argument with me, um, I'm impressed most of the time. Um, so everybody's doing these things well, but those are certainly the words of advice. One suggestion I have is, and I've made this at other, at other groups and have received laughter, and you, may, you too may laugh, but do not think that you need to use every page allotted to you by the rules of the 11th Circuit. Sometimes you just don't need to. And if I, see a, if I see a strong brief that is 10 pages less than it needs to be, I think that really says a lot for the fact that those lawyers have thought through the issues. They've called the issues down to the ones that they think they're really correct on. And they want us as judges to see their concise application of those legal principles to the facts in their case. Now, that's not to say sometimes you do need every page. Sometimes you do need every word. And, and this is a lesson that I probably could have learned myself. I still remember in college, 
my friend and I were sitting there working on our final thesis our senior year and it was two in the morning and she said, you know what, I'm done. And she changed hers to 14 point courier font and reached the page number. I changed mine to 10 point times new room and it reached the page number. So I, this, I was saying maybe do as I say and not as I did, but make sure that, you, that you're respectful of the fact that the judges have, we are paying attention to every single page and it's a lot easier for us to get your point if you really winnow it down to the right issues and making them in an efficient way. I think it's also important if you can if you can figure out how to do it to have at least two moods before an argument. Um, the first one will be when you get all the kinks out and figure out really how to make your argument, and the second is when you can really refine those points. Um, when I was arguing a lot in appellate courts, I really wanted to make sure that I never heard a question for the first time when I was actually in front of the judges. Um, and that's, that's a luxury that's sometimes hard to achieve, but I think it, it helps so much and it really helps the judges to see that you've thought through your case and have answered even some of the more off the wall questions. Everyone thinks about a case differently. And so it's great to hear from lawyers other than you who haven't been focused on it day by day and night by night like you have before you're up there. Well, I, I agree with everything that's been said by uh, Judges Branch and Judge Grant. Um, one of the things that I did want to say is at the Third District Court of Appeal, sometimes we would ask the parties to be prepared to address a certain case or be prepared to discuss something. If a court sends you an order asking you to be prepared to discuss something, you should be prepared to discuss that case and that <laughs> issue. And you'd be surprised to, to know that um, some parties were not necessarily prepared to discuss the case or the issue after receiving something from the court. Um, I also can't stress enough what Judge Branch said about professionalism and reputation. It is something that can be easily lost. And when the court asks a question saying, and maybe I misread the record, but I understood the record to say X. If a judge is asking that question, they've read the record and it's, um, really important for attorneys to remember that they are also officers of the court and they have an obligation to be forthright. And I understand that that could be difficult in terms of you may be conceding a point for a client, but it's important to do so because you are officers of the court. And um, I can't stress that enough. You really need to be accurate with what you represent to the court, whether it's a, a case or the record. Additionally, I think that it, I think it comes with uh, experience, but you don't also have to use all your time at oral argument. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sometimes that's hard to do because uh, clients are paying a lot of money for you to argue a case, but sometimes you don't need mm -hmm. all the time that's been allotted to you. And you can just ask the court after you make your presentation, if the court has any questions, uh, I will sit down and rest on my briefs. I know that's difficult to do, but sometimes if the court, we're not shy people. So if we have questions, we will ask you questions. And if we, there are no further questions, then I think it's okay to sit down and not take up all the time. And, and to Barbara's point real quick, um, you can tell by our body language. There's a point at which with the, all of a sudden you'll see all the judges kind of <laughs> lean back and we're just standing like that. And I've, I've had a couple of people who've said, and you can see their, their posture changes like this. And they go, so I'm, I know I have eight minutes left, but unless you have any other questions, I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> and we're all like, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna give one silly thing and one, one substantive thing. And again, in part, I've been there for like three seconds. So um, this is just the, the, the silly and, and one substantive thing I've seen, uh, at least on the briefs that I've read on the 11th Circuit so far. One is, we do everything on paper, believe it or not. Um, I'm amazed that nothing has changed since I clerked. Not a single <laughs> thing has changed um, in, in however many years it's been. Um, and, and by that I mean, so there's still, as everyone knows, there's the red brief, there's the blue brief, there's the gray brief. And, and you know, you, everyone has those binding machines. If you're an attorney and you get one of those and you're sending it to the court, 
just test the pages to see if they actually move there. It, it, believe it or not, I, I spend a lot of time, I end up unbinding a lot of these things because it's impossible to turn the pages in any way that would help me to manipulate it. The best ones are those that are sort of like, that are like spiral bound where you can sort of put it on the back and the front. Um, so just a little silly tip, but uh, believe it or not, you're gonna make your judge really happy if you can go and do it that way because you spend a lot of time with those briefs. They're my best friends. Um, the substantive thing is this. I, I'm amazed at at how much assumptions are made in briefs. So p parties tend to make the, you know your case so well. This especially applies if you're the trial lawyer litigating the case on appeal. You know your case so well that you make assumptions about the facts and the law that you know so well, but I as the judge am the first time I'm ever seeing this is reading your brief. And so I don't know step one, two, and three before you get to five, six, and seven. Tell me step one, two, and three before you get to five, six, and seven. And same thing with the law. Walk me through it. Don't just get to the, this is wrong because of this case. Walk me through exactly why from, this is the, the, this is the statute that we have. These are how, if there's precedent interpreting that statute, this is how it's been interpreted. If not, this is what it means. And here is why, as applied to the facts of this case, this is right or wrong. And, and I'm just amazed at how, how rarely you get to see that, that sort of level of clarity and thinking. Think about the best opinions you've ever read. They're so clear. You, you look at them like, it's obvious. Um, and you, you just, you wanna aim to write that way. None of us get there, we all try. Um, but try to, that's the aim that you have. And I think that's gonna help you to win your case over your opponent. So I think we have time for about one more question and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. And I think obviously when you go to a federal society event, let alone the Florida conference, um, you walk out with a lot of unbelievable knowledge. I doubt any of you thought when you go back to your law firms, you're gonna be testing the spiral bounds on the pages <laughs> of your briefs, but there are practical things you learn as well. Um, so the last question I have is a little more academic, but we all know that there's a lot of talk about uh, activism in the judiciary. And, and I would ask if each of you would, would let us know how you define judicial activism, and more importantly than that, do you have any habits for maintaining your focus on your role under the Constitution, or does it become second nature? Judge Branch. The way I would define judicial activism is when you're a judge and you decide that this is the outcome you want and then you walk the opinion backwards to make sure that you reach that result. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any particular habits that I have to avoid that. Um, Certainly the, the very basic things, a lot of which have been discussed at this conference, that we're, and, and I think Justice Warren earlier uh, this morning said it well, we're just trying to reach the right result. So that, if that's your approach, you're necessarily um, staying pretty far away from judicial activism. And the, the other way that you're kept away from um, any kind of outcome determined result is you're as a judge, you are issuing opinions that you wish you didn't have to issue. Um, heck, if you, <laughs> if you Google me from um, my time on my last court, um, I, there was an opinion that, that I had issued that had a relatively scathing dissent, um, and it was all in the press, and it was about an upskirting issue, and it's always, not the best thing in the world as a female judge to be known as the upskirting judge. Um, but it was, a, it was a very difficult, it was a statutory interpretation issue and, and I made it clear in the opinion, this is not, and when we were ending, we ended up reversing uh, his conviction. He was taking photographs under a woman's skirt in a grocery store and it was an, an old statute where really the statute hadn't caught up with technology. And, and I made it very clear in the opinion, and everything I'm telling you is in the opinion, um, very clear that this is not my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do at all. Um, and said, you know, this is not my place to, to, to recraft the statute to reach the result that I would like and urged the legislature to fix it, which the Georgia legislature, as soon as they came back into session, fixed it. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's it, as long as you are very mindful of, of your constitutional lane and the separation of powers and that you are a judge who's going to have to issue throughout your lifetime a lot of decisions that aren't the way that you would come out if you really had a choice of not following the law, but you have to follow the law. 
And so I think that sort of sets it in motion the, the way it should be. I cannot agree more with what Judge Branch just said, and I'll spare making all of you listen to me say it again. Um, I'll just note one interesting piece about that dynamic is for people who have a view of the statutory and constitutional interpretation process that is more of a living purpose-based view, it's very easy for them to know in a given case what a judge that they support will do because they may think they may understand that that judge supports the same results um, that a, a purposes-based analysis might inevitably lead them to. It's sometimes a lot harder for someone who has a textualist or originalist philosophy that they seek and judges that they support to really know what that judge is gonna do, or, or maybe they know it, but they may not always like the result in a given case. Um, so hopefully you, you know what a textualist will do in a situation, which is interpret the text and explain in the judicial opinion what that statute says or what that constitutional provision says. And so I do think it creates an interesting dynamic in that you're less able to really know that you'll agree with the, with the result if you've got the type of perspective that flows from figuring out what the text of the Constitution or what the text of the statute says. But I think that's the, the most important part of our job and a, real, um, a really important part of our constitutional role is to let the legislature be the body that makes the policy and we can sit here and interpret it and if they want to change it, that's their job, not ours. Well, there's not much that I can add to what both of you have said, but the, the truth is is that when and I think everyone here has reached opinions where they don't agree with the result, but it is what the law requires. And I think that that's important because it teaches humility and it teaches you to understand what your proper role is in the structure and the separation of powers and the limitation of the judicial branch. And uh, that is really the difference. That's if the difference between a textualist approach and an approach where you have a living constitution and to understand that your role is limited and that you are not a member of the legislative body, you are a member of the judicial body. And uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult to do, but that's when you know that when you're not necessarily agreeing and you're issuing an opinion and you're compelled, this is the result that is compelled, that's when you know that you are not a judicial activist. I completely agree with the definition of judicial activism given by, by Judge Branch. If you, you ever want to hear a great discussion of it, watch uh, Judge Lagoa at her uh, confirmation hearing answer that very question about what is judicial activism. It was a, a textbook answer and one that I completely agreed with then and now. Um, with, with regard to tips, here, here's mine that, that I always do. Start at the beginning. Think about every Supreme Court opinion that you love. They start, so take like a Fifth Amendment uh, uh, Miranda sort of case. They don't start with Miranda. They don't say, in Miranda, we held this. They start with the language of the Fifth Amendment. Everyone knows what it is. Everyone understands it. But they actually open up the Constitution, and they write it in there. And then they go to what the language meant and if there is precedent on point about that. And that's the check that we can do for ourselves. Start with the statute. So if it, and that's mostly what we deal with. So if it's a sex discrimination case, open up Title VII, see what it has to say, and then go to McDonnell Douglas and talk about the burden shifting test um, before you get there. But if you're doing that, then you are start, as long as you analytically get there, then you're gonna not do exactly what Judge Branch said, which is start backwards with, we should affirm here because this is kind of bad, and then we should affirm for this case, and this case, and this case, and this case. Um, so if you analytically do it that way, that's my tip for how we should, we could all be consistent as best as we possibly can and have the fight that, that Judge Pryor talked about today, have the fight on textual terms. Well, at this time, I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, I think we have one microphone here. No more questions from Judge Katzis, please. <laughs> <laughs> sure, come on up, we can get to it. <laughs> There we go. One question for the panel. Having clerked in an appellate court before, I know that even if judges are in agreement on a case, it's rare that they would have written the same decision that another judge had written. 
And I wonder, you all may be different, I doubt that's the case, but I wonder if you could maybe share with us what is kind of the decision point when you're looking at something to decide, do we just agree, do we concur, you know, do we just say, I, I, you know, a very short paragraph, we go through and decide when you actually write something different from the majority of the Well, Judge Branch, for Judge Luck, go ahead. No, please. Order. No, please. For me, um, I've, I think, as we've all said, it's very important. Collegiality is, is very important. And so if there's, if there's a way to get to yes, then I think um, sometimes a judge will take out a particular part of the opinion that maybe, maybe it was more their gloss and less what a different judge would think about. For me, though, if I, if I disagree substantively with a legal analysis, it's not something that I'm going to be able to join. And so I think that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of determining whether I can join or not. Um, if someone says something a little bit differently than I would have, then maybe I, maybe I first get them to try to change their phrasing. But as long as the, as long as the actual analysis is consistent with what I think, then I think that's part of, part of the give and take. Of course, we're not all going to write everything the same. But if there's something that I, that I believe is incorrect under the law, then that's when I'm going to be forced to write a dissent, um, or sometimes a, a partial dissent and partial concurrence. Judge Luck, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah my, my t I, I, I agree with, with that completely. Um, it, there's two aspects to this. One is, it, to me, I've always judged it as, is it wrong? It, there are things that are said that aren't necessarily wrong, but I either might not say it that way, or, you know, I can live with that. It's not going to do damage to the law in any way. That's there. If it's wrong, there's no way you can agree to that. The second component of that is the collegiality element, and that is having a good enough working relationship with your court, with your colleagues, to be able to say, hey, listen, this is a great 50-page opinion you put. I agree with 49 pages of it. There's this one page with a few facts and a few things here that I think are a little off. Would you mind stating it this way or looking at it this way or taking a look at this case or citing it this way or something like that? And, and I have to tell you, my experience has been uh, almost uniformly that every colleague is receptive to that kind of thing. Because we all are in it to get to yes, to get to the right answer. And so the receiving end is, you're happy a colleague is looking, I'm always happy a colleague's looking at this to say, this is right, that makes me feel better. That, that brilliant people like the ones I have on this stage are looking at the same exact thing and saying, yeah, that's right. I may not have written it that way, you may stink, but that's right. Um, <laughs> They wouldn't tell me that, of course. Uh, but so being receptive to those sorts of things is part of being on a collegial court. So th those, to me, are the two aspects of it. And, and that give and take um, is happening every day. I mean, there's certain, certainly a, some opinions, you know, this is, this is not going to be published. And it's just a small issue. And so may, and you agree with the analysis, but it's not the way you would have written it. Maybe you don't make an edit. Um, and if it's published, so maybe that ratchets up what you're going to push back on. Um, but there's certain things it, it, that I'm going to push back on no matter what, whether it's published, unpublished, anything. If I, if I can't sign my name to that, then I'm not going to. And if I can get a concession from my colleague, if, it's, if they're willing to make that concession, then I'm willing to sign on. Um, and if not, I'm not. So. I think we have time. One more question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, earlier in the discussion, uh, I believe one of you mentioned that the 11th Circuit is on a per-judge basis, one of the busiest in the country. Uh, and to my understanding, one of the reasons it's been so successful in uh, putting out decisions at a rate higher than comparably busy courts is because you've been very good with uh, having judges from out of circuit and district judges sit by designation. Uh, but I wonder if I could get your thoughts on the future of the court. Uh, as the population of states like Florida, Georgia, Alabama grows, do you think ultimately there will have to be more judges to handle the load, or do you think that through techniques like having other judges sit by designation, you can sort of continue to manage the load. Go ahead, Judge Branch. Well, I was going to say, I think, I think one thing that is great to manage the load is the incredible and very active judges who have chosen to, gone, to, have chosen to go senior and give us incredible new colleagues like these. Um, essentially, we've, we've added two judges to the court based on the workload that the judges that they, um, whose slots that they have filled um, 
the workload that those two gentlemen plan to still do. And so I think, I think in the short term, especially, we're, we're very fortunate. And we've developed lots of ways to, to deal with a workload. And it certainly is busy, but I think it's manageable. So I don't, I don't think that I'm, I'm certainly not um, anticipating an addition in, in judges anytime soon. I will add that one way that we manage that workload is by, again, having so many unpublished decisions. And I'll offer a pro tip here for those of you lucky enough to be in the room and hear me say our rules are really followed. Unpublished opinions are not binding precedent. And so I know it can be really exciting when you find that great unpublished case that's exactly like yours and you want to have three pages about it in the brief. And that's, that's fine, but just know that published cases are precedential and unpublished cases are not. And you know, consider, consider, that, consider that as you're drafting and thinking of, up your very best arguments. And, and I will add to that. I'm not offering up any commentary um, about our court and future needs or things that we don't need um, as far as adding or not adding judges. I'm not going to offer any opinion on that. And I do want to reiterate that I'm so grateful every day for the number of senior judges that we have and that they're willing to take as much of the workload as they do. Um, and it's hard to imagine our court without them. Um, but I will say, when I was on the Court of Appeals of Georgia, when I first started, uh, we were a court of 12, which is exactly what the 11th Circuit is. And we expanded to 15. So I actually got to go through that firsthand and experience both a court, an intermediate appellate court of 12 and an intermediate court, appellate court of 15. There are pros and cons to an expansion of a court. Um, one of the, the issues that made it difficult for us, um, and this was just a, a, a facility issue, was where do you put the judges? And so we actually ended up in the same, there's a sort of complex of three buildings that are joined together, and we had to move the, the new panel that we added over to the new, uh, the new building. And what, what's odd is that was actually, that decreased some collegiality, because I never went over to the new space. Um, and so I always thought, oh, they're over in the other building. Um, now in the 11th Circuit, I'm like, wow, you're in another state. <laughs> um, and, and so that has taken some getting used to. And it's funny, now I look back on my old court and say, wow, they were really closer than I thought they were. Um, so it, it, expansion of courts brings its challenges. I will tell you that debate, if you, if you look at the history of the 11th Circuit, that debate has been going on since the founding of the 11th Circuit. I can tell you statistically, there was 12 when Florida was, what were we in 1979, 1980, 81? 10 million people? Um, it was 12 when we grew, when we doubled that size, and it's 12 now. Um, that's true for Georgia, which has grown leaps and bounds, and it's true of Alabama, which continues to grow. Um, and somehow we've been able to, to deal with that. Um, I agree. I mean, I'm not here to offer an opinion on whether it should or shouldn't expand. Again, I just found the bathroom the other day. Um, so so I, I, what I can tell you is uh, the court, at least when I was clerking, seemed to operate well. From what I can tell in the months that I've been there, seems to operate very well. Um, and we are very blessed with, uh, with the number of senior judges we have. I do think as a trend, you will likely see less visiting judges from outside the circuit uh, now than you will there. I think there's a product of a few different things, but I think you will see less visiting judges uh, in the future. We had one more question. Yeah, sure, absolutely, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. This, this isn't really, really a question. It is just, uh, as president of the society, I just wanted to th thank, ev thank everyone here. Thank, thank this panel, but thank everyone here, especially the people who've been organizing this conference, because this is the largest conference we've had outside of our national convention. And Florida, 15 to 20 years ago, we were not terribly strong in this state. It's become incredibly strong, incredibly effective, done so many of the things we want to do. And it's because of the hard work of, of people like Jesse and Jason, but also so many of you who are running our chapters in the, in, in the various cities in Florida. There are about eight or nine major cities in Florida, as best I can tell. They all seem to have active chapters. Uh, so many of you are involved in the chapters in one way or another. I just want, on, the, on the behalf of the national office, to express thank you to all of you for a wonderful conference and for wonderful activity here. Thank you. I can, I can think of no better way to end this panel than with that. Um, obviously, and thank you so much to 
uh, all of our judges from the 11th Circuit for being here, for sharing their knowledge with all of us. Uh, I would reiterate, as my colleague Judge Barber said, uh, thank you to, to Jason, to Jesse, to all the leadership for putting uh, such an amazing conference together over the last few days. Uh, this has really been a treat for all of us to be able to share time with our newest judges on the 11th Circuit. And with that, we're adjourned.